I'm Ron Wallace, pastor of the Shallowford Free Will Baptist Church in Marietta. We're glad that you're able to be with us today by video. We're living in very troubled times, and our prayers are for you and your family. Uh, it's sad to hear of the number of people that are either sick or hospitalized or those who are in fear having been exposed to the coronavirus. Uh, but remember that God is on your side and He will uh, bless if you will reach out to Him and trust Him, then uh, certainly you can expect Him to uh, intervene in your life. Uh, today we're uh, again at that time where things are very uncertain. The uh, churches are not able to meet and for that reason many of us are trying to uh, keep touch with our people through all means possible and we're not professionals, we're not televangelists, uh, but we do simply try to minister. And the ministering is important to us because we know that God's people, uh, the very people that are the sheep of His pasture, uh, they need the food that God has. They need the support system. They need in their life all that the shepherd, uh, being the great shepherd first and then the under shepherds, all that they can do. Uh, to encourage and help and um, to, to add the spiritual benefits to our lives. So today we're doing that and we trust that you would receive some spiritual food uh, from these moments. Uh, Passion Week began with triumphal entry. Jesus entered Jerusalem and then uh, on the end of that week, toward the end of that week, uh, he met with his disciples in what is referred to as the upper room. Uh, he instituted the Lord's Supper, uh, washed their feet, and then they went out into the Garden of Gethsemane. Now the Garden of Gethsemane is the crisis point. When Jesus arrives there, uh, he prayed that uh, this cup that he's about to drink, reference to uh, the fact that he would die for as a sin offering, that this bitter cup uh, could pass from him, but very submissive to the will of God. Uh, Jesus said, Father, not as my will, but as your will uh, be done. And he, and he submitted himself uh, from that point on, literally, to be the sin offering. That was already in God's plan, and he was already agreed to it. But remember, uh, at this point, it's, it's just a few seconds before the actual death. Uh, uh, just hours before the death. And uh, uh, Judas would soon be entering that garden and planting the treacherous kiss upon his cheek. Uh, the reason Gethsemane is important and the reason uh, we need to mention the crisis that took place here, uh, it, it, it's fitting. The word Gethsemane literally means the place of the wine press where uh, they would crush the grapes and of course by crushing the grapes and extracting the juice they would make wine. But Jesus is crushed also in Gethsemane. His spirit is crushed. His soul is crushed because here uh, all the pressure that sin can exert is upon him. He knows what it's going to be to become the sin offering. You remember John 129 said uh, John declared him as the Lamb of God. We're now seeing that moment when the Lamb of God must be slain. And uh, because of that, Jesus being fully aware of it, uh, totally submitted to it, he becomes not only the Lamb of God as the substitute, but He is literally the sacrifice. And the reason we see the cross, it, it's not because it just so happened that in this moment of time uh, that uh, Jesus was crucified. Uh, it was in God's plan all along. Uh, the very tragedy of that death, if, uh, if it had been some other society, perhaps the death would have been different. But the cross has become a symbol to us. And the cross is a symbol of not only Jesus dying, but it is a symbol of the fact that on that cross, uh, He died for us and He is our victory. And indeed, uh, we'll see the rest of that when we talk about resurrection. But uh, just remind you, and I'll read a verse with you. Uh, this one is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, where it talks about the very precious blood of Christ. We're not redeemed, he said, with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. And it is that blood of Christ, that lamb without blemish 
and without spot. That literally is our sacrificial offering. And Jesus, in order to be that, must be sinless. He must be free of any kind of contamination. Uh, as you remember in the Old Testament requirement for the Lamb that was slain on the Day of Atonement, that Lamb had to be without blemish, it had to be without spot, it, had, it could have no deformities, and all of that is symbolic of the fact that it must be a sinless Lamb. And Jesus indeed is that sinless Lamb. Isn't that amazing that during the trial, when Jesus has been arrested, and on that night, you remember, uh, he's taken first uh, to the Jewish court, which is the Sanhedrin. They met in the night, and they met at Caiaphas' home. And uh, at that particular meeting, uh, they so-called put him on trial. And they, and they made false charges. They even paid for false witnesses. But when Jesus arrived before Pilate, which would uh, sometime the arrest is probably around midnight, uh, by 2 o'clock he's in the home of Caiaphas, and then of course they take him to the home of Annas, the, uh, the uh, co-high priest, and then by 6 o'clock Jesus has been condemned by them and the charges have been set and he's brought before Pilate. Pilate's trial uh, is the Roman aspect of it. This is the Gentile aspect. And you notice how thorough God is. Uh, the Jewish people condemned him, that is through the Sanhedrin. The Roman people, the Gentiles of the world, would condemn him as well. And in that court, in that trial, he would literally be sentenced to death. It's funny though, or interesting, ironic, that uh, Pilate on four separate occasions in discussing or talking to Jesus and doing all that Pilate did from the time of the questions, uh, the scourges, the different things that Pilate did four different times. He said that I find no fault in him. And if you remember, Pilate was completely willing to release him. He said to the people, uh, I find no fault of execution. And uh, that's another way of God saying my son is innocent. Uh, in the human court, there cannot really be charges that would stick, that were true, that proved that he was a sinful or a violent or a criminal in that sense of person. So, uh, yet, when Pilate is putting him on trial, he even tried to placate the Jewish people and the, certainly the leaders, and remember they had incited this, uh, by offering a substitute. And so, therefore, Barabbas, who was a noted criminal, uh, as a man who was under condemnation, and the pilot offered for, for, in fact, he put the two up and said, uh, here's Barabbas, he is a criminal, here's Jesus in whom I find no fault. And a pilot offered them the opportunity to accept Jesus as the one, uh, in, in fact, that would go free. But rather they chose Barabbas. And that in itself is an illustration to us that Jesus is dying not for himself, not for his own sin, not for his own guilt. Barabbas was guilty. Jesus is innocent. But the reality of it is that Jesus is now willing to die in a substitutionary fashion for every single one of us who are sinners. And beloved, that's all of us. So Jesus is willing to take your place and to take my place. And you remember it goes even a step further. When they were on the cross, uh, the three criminal, the three men, Jesus declared a criminal by that time. When they were on the cross, one of those two criminals who died with him also made the confession. Uh, and he looked at Jesus and he asked him, if you remember, to remember him uh, when he came into paradise. And uh, the two criminals are talking to each other. And one of them said, this man is innocent, referring to Jesus. He's done no wrong. But we're guilty. We're hanging here because we're guilty. But not this man. And then he confessed him and asked him, said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, uh, would you remember me? And Jesus' words, today uh, you will be in, uh, shall be with me in paradise. So you see the Lord who is innocent, uh, identified with criminals, identified as a sinner, and yet no sin whatsoever. Peter goes on in uh, his letter, or in his book, the New Testament book, 1 Peter, and he says about Jesus, he committed no sin. Uh, 
Uh, and then in another verse, he says, who himself bore our sins in his own body. So Simon Peter is reminding us that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb, that he's the substitute, that he's not dying for himself, he's dying for us. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, Paul writing to the Corinthians said, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Uh, that's a way of saying that Jesus was innocent, but he took sin upon himself. And by taking pen, a sin upon himself, he literally becomes sin for us. So you have substitution. You also have the concept of imputation. Jesus innocent became guilty. Jesus, uh, who was uh, sinless, became sin. And by doing that, he therefore could commute to us righteousness. And so we, we find those principles as Jesus died. His death is voluntary. And we talked about that a little bit in another video. Uh, voluntary simply means he knew why he was there. He was willing to be there. He is the Lamb of God. He knows he's going to be the sacrifice. His blood can do what no other blood can do, atone for sin. And so as the substitute, he's willing to do that. And then I mentioned that other word just now, the word atonement. His death is an atoning death, meaning that it covers our sins. In that, everything that you've learned or know about what, how God deals with sin in the Old Testament, and now Jesus dying to bridge that gap between the old and new and, and literally fulfill all of that which was typical of the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, he now has literally become sin for us. He is that sacrifice. God's nature, being holy, being righteous, being just, demands that sin be paid for. And that Jesus is willing to pay for that sin. So what we have is, we have God's stamp of approval upon His Son. Jesus is willing to die. He offered His blood. The Father accepts that offering and that sacrifice. Uh, by the Father putting his stamp of approval on the death of Christ, he literally says to us, to, to you and me, that if we come to that, that Savior, the one who died, Jesus Christ our Lord, and confess our sins to him, then God the Father, who's accepted the sacrifice and death of his Son, will forgive your sins and by doing so, declare you righteous. That is what God is doing on this day as His Son dies on the cross of Calvary. Beloved, I would hope today that uh, you have done the very thing that I just mentioned, that you've confessed Him as your Lord, that you've asked forgiveness for your own sins, and that you have an ongoing faith relationship with Him. You believe in Him. You love Him. You walk with Him and fellowship with Him. And your life has been changed and your life is different. All because in the garden Jesus said, Thy will, Father, be done. But on the cross, He literally took your sins and took my sins. And today we can live and enjoy our Christian life and experience because of that. Now we're leading up to the moment of the resurrection. And I hope your heart is... Uh, ready and anticipating that wonderful expression of God's mercy and God's grace. Jesus died. Jesus was buried. But Jesus is alive. Jesus came forth from the grave. May God bless you today is our prayer.